Welcome to HEC TV's live interactive program that's part of St. Louis. The whole production is pulled together. It's going to be a steel bridge on the American classic novel. The car that put America on wheels. Welcome to HEC TV Live. Welcome to HEC TV Live. Today we're at the Albarisi Corporation for our program Earth Day, Building Green. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Gore, your host for HEC TV Live. And on today, the 40th commemoration of Earth Day, really pleased to be at the Albarisi Corporation, which of course has the basically, I'm going to say, the number one green building in the world, John. Yes, I'll just go ahead and say that. that. We're here with a couple of people already. John Albarisi, Chairman of the Corporation, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for being here with us. And Grant Lanham, who's Operations Specialist at the Corporation, thanks so much for being here. This morning's program is going to deal more with the exterior of the building, its construction, and the outside part of the process. And then afternoon, we'll be back here at 1 p.m. for more HEC TV Live, where we look into the interior of the building. And John, let's start with just the nature of why you decided to go green. We had an email question that came from a school who's joining us in New Jersey. Why even decide to go green when you decide to put this building together? Sure. We certainly wanted to do something that would give our uh, all of our employees and occupants a good place to work. We wanted to have it uh, convenient, so we located next to the highway access. Transportation was good. It was in the center of the city so that we didn't take up other green space that was at the, uh, the hinterlands or new property. Uh, this was already occupied, and uh, once we saw the building that was here, and we're sort of standing in the middle of what that building would have been. And I'll stop you just for a moment because we've got an aerial view of what that building looked like before. So we'll, oh, bring, yes. we'll bring that image up, the aerial view of what the site looked like originally as we talk about this. Yes. So we thought uh, as we were going to do this project, originally it was just going to be a very conventional office. And we needed more space because we were moving from our old office. And we thought, why not do something that had more cachet, something that would actually be a challenge to the people who were doing the project? Because we had our best skilled people who could do it, and we thought, let's give them a real challenge. We had heard a lot about this green idea, but this was five years ago, and that was pretty much in its infancy. When we saw the building that was here, we thought, that might be an opportunity to do something in keeping with these green ideas that we've been hearing about. And at that time, we had never done a green building. Okay. Our architect engineer had never done a green building. So we had to learn a lot from the very start about what is this all about? What's available so that we could utilize those ideas in the project? And this building originally was some sort of industrial plant that created what? Uh, this was a metal fabricating facility. And at the far end, mm -hmm. they would run a train in with steel material. Okay. The forklift trucks would go into the cars right at the level of the workspace, and they would pull out the steel. There were gantry cranes ah. that ran the... The, uh, in each of the four bays, the entire length of the building, and they would haul the steel to where it would be fabricated at each station, and then eventually it would get to where it would be loaded on trucks and taken out for distribution around the St. Louis area. Well, all of this was a huge space, and if you were looking at it uh, and you saw the aerial view, you could fit two football fields side by side and you would have enough room for the end zones uh -huh. and you could kick outside of the end zones and you'd still be inside the building. A small this little place to work. 300 <laughs> feet by 500 feet, a big space. And it was tall because there was a lot of equipment in here. We had three meters up to the lower part of the truss that you see mm -hmm. above us. So there was a large area that we had to work with in this building. Now, we had four bays. The first two bays we put into structured parking. Mm -hmm. 
This bay we opened up by taking the roof off most of it, except what we kept mm -hmm. in order to form the transition right. from it's the... Nice. You don't have to run through the rain or the snow, obviously. You don't have to worry about uh -huh. the weather, it's covered. And then the last bay we put into the office space with an addition on the side, and we can talk mm -hmm. when we get to that side of the building about why we did that. But that gave us actually a, a look of two buildings parallel, but actually this is still just one building. All of the steel that you see, the connecting steel, is necessary for the stability of the entire structure. The parking garage, the office, mm -hmm. it's still just one building. Now this looks very open. We've added the greenery, mm -hmm. the trees, the native plants here so that it's a very inviting entryway. But it functionally is still part of that original building. The floors in the garage are the original floor, except we added a second level of parking to give us the amount of parking that we needed. Of course, we had a generous amount of space in order to do that, but we kept the steel mm -hmm. members that are uh, part of the building. We kept the original floor. And if you would look under the floor, and we'll talk about mm -hmm. this this afternoon, you would see the original floor under the bay that our office occupies right now. And all that keeping all that material was a big part of the green nature of it, of going for your LEED certification, trying to reuse as much of the materials as possible or maintain that. Absolutely. We did a lot to utilize the material that was already here, mm -hmm. even to the point where if you, if you look up on the columns, and I don't know if you can see this well at home, but there are some holes in the columns. Those were the supports. Oh, and I'll, I'll ask our cameraman, things. Andy, to go ahead and shift to that if he can. We're gonna go over there to on the, the right of where it says Albarisi Constructors. You're gonna go up that center pole and you're gonna see holes there. And Those holes supported the crane rail that the overhead cranes sat on. Now, we took those rails down because they were no longer needed. We sold off the cranes so they could be reused. But then we took those crane rails, refabricated them and brought them back, and now they're the support rails for the second floor of the garage. And if you could look into our building, you'd see it's supporting the second floor of the office as well. So even that material, which otherwise people might have said, this is scrap, we're going to just haul it away, it was reused with a new purpose. And that's what we have as part of the structure. So it's, again, a reuse or recycling of that material, but it stayed here on the premises and never went off to fill a landfill. Very cool. We'll talk about that in more depth. We're going to take a short commercial break. As always on HEC TV Live, we've got interactive schools joining us. They'll be with us when we get back. Welcome back to the Albarisi Corporation. We're here with Grant and Lanham of the Operations Specialist. We're going to talk a little bit more about the exterior of the building as you see it from this side. And Grant, let's start by talking about, I see windows are open up here. Let's yes. start by talking about just the nature of the windows. And in a lot of buildings now, when you think about office buildings, it's like they're all closed up. So you were going to try to create a better environment by having some sort of natural ventilation system? Yeah, we, uh, the windows do a couple things for us. First off, on uh, months where it's fringe temperatures, it's nice outside where typically you would open your windows at your house, turn off the air conditioning. Our building does the same thing, but it does it all automatically. Mm. We have a uh, weather station on top of our building that monitors wind speed, temperature, humidity, those type of things. When the conditions are nice, we turn off all of our air conditioning in the building and we open all the windows along the very top of the building. We also have some fans inside that help draw that mm -hmm. through the building and keep the temperature regulated for us. So we spend a good portion of the year, about a quarter of the year, where a typical building would run the air conditioning, we can turn ours off to save all that energy and just use the nice outside air to, to cool off our building. Very cool. It also provides a nice opportunity to bring fresh air into the building for all of our employees. Uh, so we have all the windows along the top, and then you can see uh, over here we have other windows that can open. We have about 260 windows that the employees can open and close anytime they like as well. And I noticed those windows are all very, very tinted. I assume there's a reason for that. Yes, we have a, uh, a pretty uh, unique strategy for tinting the windows on the building. This side of the building, which is the northeast, 
Our windows are tinted fairly dark, but they're a little lighter than they are on the south side of our building. Oh. What that does for us uh, from an energy standpoint, by having the windows tinted darker, it keeps a lot of that solar heat mm -hmm. out of the building. It still allows plenty of sunlight in for our employees to enjoy. It keeps all that heat out so we don't have to waste the energy to then air condition it back out later. Very cool. Well, we're going to begin to walk inside the building. Well, we're also going to be joined by Christy Cunningham Saylor, who's environmental specialist for the building. And John, as we all walk back inside, we've had a question come in about the time period it took for the construction. Talk a little bit about that. How long did it take to renovate the space? We took about uh, 14 months to plan the project, do the engineering on what it would take in order to give us all of the space requirements that we had for this building. And then it took about 11 months to actually do the project. And that's a fairly short amount of time to do something of this uh, magnitude, but with all the planning and forethought that we put into it, it accelerated the building process. Now we're here in the uh, interior of the building now, the lobby area that you would walk into. And we'll spend much more time here in the afternoon. We've been joined by Christy cunningham Saylor. Thanks so much for being with us, environmental specialist. Thank what does you. that mean exactly? Um, well, like as far as my job role in grants, um, in the consulting group that is part of Albarisi, we do a lot of um, helping others, owners, um, school groups, developers build green buildings. So, and that's actually Vertigy. Yes, Vertigy is the firm that we work for and we might help look for a um, energy efficient glass, a material such as a carpet that has a higher recycle content or maybe a um, healthier indoor adhesive. Very cool. Now everybody hopefully has noticed and I'll ask Jane or camera person to go ahead and eliminate me from the shot Jane and move over to the outside where we can begin to look through the windows and you'll behind John and, and Grant you'll notice that from the inside those windows are exceptionally clear and so uh, that's kind of a unique so the tinting only works one way John is our Grant the tinting only works one way. Well it also helps inside as well uh, you wouldn't think it right offhand, it's not quite intuitive, but by having the windows tinted a little darker, we actually need less mechanical light, less man-made oh. light inside the building, because the darker windows reduce all of the glare coming in. So you know you've been in an older building where you're standing back to the window and you're looking at me and you can't see anything but a dark shadow. Uh -huh. In our building, we can stand right up next to the windows and you can see me perfectly because we have that tinting on the back of the windows. Oh, very cool. And let's just spend a little bit of talking about what's in this space in terms of materials because since we're actually in the lobby, because we're obviously dealing, th this, this carpeted floor is, is individual pieces of, of carpet tile, right? Yes, they and, are. And are these like made from recycled products or? Uh, yes, we have a high recycled content uh, in our carpet. Uh, used soda pop bottles were used to make the carpeting. Um, the adhesive that holds the carpet onto the floor is also environmentally friendly. It doesn't have a lot of odors that would bother someone coming off of it. Very cool. And the wall is bamboo? Yes, it's uh, bamboo plywood. It's nothing but, it's just solid bamboo. And then again, the glues that they use to hold, hold it together, uh, no added urea formaldehyde. So again, it's not going to off-gas mm -hmm. any harmful things for the occupants in the building. Very cool. And we'll talk much more about the interior nature of the building as we uh, deal with that this afternoon. We're going to begin to walk now from here to your cafeteria operation. And, and let's, let's talk a little bit about the nature of why you decided that you wanted a cafeteria on site and how you think that affects worker productivity, quality, all that as we begin to move there. Okay, fine. We had in our old building a cafeteria because we didn't have many opportunities for people to go out and get a lunch in that neighborhood. This is uh, much more urban here with a lot of time uh, uh, that people could get out to uh, find places nearby, fast food places and, and such, but that's not really very healthy. And what we wanted was to provide something for our employees that would be seen as a benefit uh -huh. and be able to utilize their time during the day more productively. Now, it would, to some people, uh, if you said, well, we're going to have cafeteria, uh, and we're going to charge two dollars for a full lunch. You can have a salad, you can have a main course, you can have dessert, coffee, tea, milk, everything that you would want. I was told the chocolate milk was very, very good this it's morning. It's very popular. <laughs> so we, we charge two dollars. Now someone would look at that and say, you know, that's a subsidy. You're, you're having to subsidize these lunches. That's a real cost to the company. You could eliminate that. You could eliminate the cafeteria and put all of that money to the bottom line. 
which is something that uh, maybe the chief financial officer would look and say reasonably this is a cost we could eliminate. Mm -hmm. But then you have to look at the benefits. Because we have the cafeteria on site, people can run down and get a quick lunch if they need to get back to their work. They can have lunch and get back there more quickly. They don't take their entire lunch hour. They turn it into productive time. Or they could take it back and make phone calls while they're eating lunch. They can stay here and have conversations with other people. Perhaps they want to have those conversations in the rest of the day. They get to do it at lunch because everyone is relaxed mm -hmm. and having lunch here. Or maybe you would come in and want to have a conference and I'd say, come by at lunch. Everyone mm -hmm. has to eat, come by, we'll talk then. So we turn time that otherwise we would have to use during the day into productive time at lunch. And when you balance that recovery of time, mag mm. magnified by the number of people that we have in the building, against the cost side of it, mm. it's a good trade. Besides that, we have healthy lunches. If someone wants to have vegetarian, if they want to just have a salad, if they want to have heart healthy entrees, we have those. And those, I think, <clears throat> are going to add to the health of the office over time. And, by the way, we get all those people here and turn that into productive time as well. Even if it isn't productive as you would define it uh, by a manager's definition, it gets people together. It gets them talking together. They feel more like a family and families have meals together, they talk about things, they socialize, and that creates more cohesion in the group. And every company needs that kind of outlet as much as they need those workers at their desks. They also need very happy and satisfied people who are working together and happy to be that community of workers. Very cool. We're going to begin to move to the back of the building now as we talk more about the exterior. And Christy, I'll ask you this question that came from the kids because it applies directly to what John was talking about. Talk about worker productivity or what is it, what's it like to like work in an environment like this? Um, worker productivity here is hard for us to measure because we don't produce widgets. Um, we work with different teams. Albarisi as a company has um, different offices, one in Canada, mm -hmm. one in Mexico, Atlanta. Um, Michigan. So that's hard to measure. We've got the aerial view of the site we're going to go to again so you see that. And we'll go to the after aerial view so we know what the site looks like now uh, as a result of its construction. And you're going to notice of course that the back of the building uh, has this sawtooth uh, design to it. And Grant, let's talk about the site orientation of the building. How does the sawtooth help that? What's its purpose? Let's go start there. Okay, the original exterior wall of the building that was here that John spoke about earlier, the big manufacturing shed, faced mostly west, which everyone knows the west sun is very hot coming in a building. It's really bright. You don't really want that in your building. So it was decided that we could do build an architectural element that would look nice, as well as let's change the orientation of the backside of our building. So the glass wall that you see on each one of these sawtooths faces exactly south. So the south sun is a lot cooler. It's more predictable. We can do the tinting that we wanted. Like I said, these windows are much darker than the rest of the building. So it helps get all of that good light into the building. It's not so hot. We can filter it out with the tinting. It just worked out as a, uh, a nice amenity space as well because it makes a neat space inside the office for people to work too. Oh yeah, very cool. Because as I stand right here on the patio, directly behind me would be west. Yes. And so we're talking, well obviously everybody's probably seeing the lovely bright sunshine <laughs> off my bald pate this morning. And then the afternoon it would be popping in this way for massive sunburn. So that the sawtooth effect really makes that happen. Now notice we've also got like shades, awnings, that kind of thing. And yes. the purpose of that is similar in terms of like helping you exactly. with the light going inside. Yes. Uh, it is still fairly bright on this side of the building. So we put the shading out there, one to help cut down on energy use. Also, it cuts even further down on the glare because there's several people that their desks are right next to the windows. Mm -hmm. So it cuts down on that glare for those folks sitting right next to the windows as well. Okay, very cool. 
So now the whole orientation of the building though was designed to like renew green space that was here, right? You tried to uh, eliminate as much as possible impervious concrete surfaces and do as much as possible green surfaces. And it, it's, it's like impossible for folks not to notice, look, native prairie restoration in progress, the signage right there. John, why did you guys think this was an important part of what you wanted to do? Why restore the land like this? Why go na natural? We thought, no, let's keep it more natural in keeping with what we're trying to do inside with the green space. Carry over to the entire campus. We have the water features. We have other things that make it look very natural. And although this is a very urban setting mm -hmm. here in the middle of St. Louis County, it creates a very nice space so that when people have their lunches they can come out on the patio they can enjoy the green space they can see the birds they can uh, walk through the trails which meander around mm -hmm. the lake features they can have a walk and it just renews you because it's part of nature and you're a lot closer to it with the native plantings when we did the prairie we realized we did not need a permanent irrigation system, so we didn't have to pay for that. We also don't have the water usage that would be involved with that. These plants have thrived in the Midwest for hundreds of years. They're going to keep living as long as uh, nature provides the, the air and water that it needs. That's no problem. It's a very low maintenance space. We don't have to have mechanized equipment to come in and mow it. We only knock down the prairie once a year in order to give the new growth a chance to, for the sunlight. So we only bring in equipment once a year and that's a very time and energy mm -hmm. saving idea. You don't need any chemicals. You don't need any fertilizers in order to maintain these plants. So it cuts down on your carbon footprint because you don't have all that mm -hmm. mechanized equipment having to deal with it. It cuts down on any additives that you would need to add to a lawn. And it's a very natural surrounding. And I think it's very pretty when we have the tall grasses in the summer and even into the fall, you get that lovely swaying of the plants and to me that's a lot nicer than just seeing a pile of grass out there in a very uniform landscape. Well even when we were here a month ago you can tell there's a great deal of difference in terms of what's grown up since we were here like a month ago filming and even in the winter looking out on landscape is a little more interesting than just looking out on concrete for sure. It adds texture and color which you don't have with a lawn. Mm -hmm. And so that's wonderful. And besides that, if we have, uh, uh, a, if you get a picture down, we're getting the insects, uh -huh. the bees coming back. And it's all great because that adds more variety to what we have here. It creates an environment which is conducive to their health. So all of that, I think, is a reason to have the prairie because of the low maintenance, because of the low cost, and because it's very good for the land mm -hmm. to grow the prairie and to renew the soil as it does. We've had some student questions come in about the outside, and don't forget to our viewers who are watching on the television, live at hectv.org, you can send email questions as well. So we have questions from that audience as well as the students who are asking questions. But they're, all, they're interested about the, the use of water. Uh, and I know part of what uh, they were asking about is like stormwater runoff and drainage systems, that kind of thing. So does this affect, I mean, was the landscape designed in a way to make sure that you minimize stormwater runoff? Does the drainage system work? Does the water that comes here in any way affect the water as you use it in the plant? Sure. Okay, uh, yeah, we Grant. We have uh, several strategies. The overarching strategy for us is to not discharge stormwater off of our site at all when it rains. So we have the retention pond here. There's another one in the front. Mm -hmm. uh, the water from the parking garage roof actually goes into a tank that we built, and that's the water we use to flush our toilets with in the building. So we're reusing that water for that instead of fresh potable water. That oh, very drinking cool. Water. And, and actually, you guys have like a big cistern, right? That was yes. here. Okay. Exactly. And, we, and we've got, we've got a, an image of the cistern that you guys sent us, so everybody can look at that as we talk about it. Talk about the nature of the cistern and how it operates and how you guys use it. Yeah, so like I said, the water that kind of hits the parking garage roof when it rains, instead of taking that and discharging it into a pond, uh -huh. we take it and pipe it into this big 38,000 gallon concrete tank that we built. 
Um, John mentioned earlier that trains used to come into the building, so there's a natural depression mm -hmm. in the building, so you can unload the trains. Well, we just took that pit that was already there, put our cistern tank inside of it, and put a floor on top. So we didn't have to do any extra digging. It was just a natural spot for Very it. Very cool. So we bring the water out of there, uh, filter it, give it some chlorine, and then bring it back to the building, and that's what we use for all of our sewage conveyance. Now, we had a question that came from our students in New Jersey. Uh, so what do you do in case of a drought? Do you find yourself with enough water, or have you ever had to deal with not having enough water in the cistern? I believe in the last five years we have had to add water one day. Otherwise, that tank is large enough that it has all of the, the sewage. Mm -hmm. And we also have the makeup water for the heating and air conditioning. It takes care of all of that. And we have had one day when we had to add water to it. But apart from that, nature is the best source. Pretty impressive. Now, I'm sure everybody's wondering about the big white thing they see behind us, because here we are in the middle of the prairie. Yes. Somehow in the middle of this natural prairie, we see this wind turbine. Wind turbines are, um, are rather um, expensive. We found this that was used in a California um, setting years ago, and it, we bought it, refurbished it, and brought it here. Um, we raised it a couple of feet so we can maximize the wind. Um, at the same time, it was designed the size to give us about 20 percent, well, 17 to 18 percent of our electrical use. Today, it's a little windy, but not windy enough to, to start it going. It goes about six to seven miles an hour, about nine to ten miles an hour when it starts going fast enough to mm -hmm. produce a little bit of electricity. Then when you get over 25 to 30 miles an hour on a constant basis, then we can pull um, pretty much run all our lighting in our facility off what that produces. Now, it's only a one directional feed. It doesn't go back to the grid for a couple of reasons, safety, some metering equipment. At the time we were doing the project, Missouri um, had some, I guess, uh, how do you even say it? We, we now have a net metering law that, that ah. makes it easier for um, companies, businesses, residences to use on renewable energy. You were moving ahead of the law then. We, well, I'm not, I wouldn't, <laughs> staying I wouldn't a, say. Staying a, foot, a step ahead of the law there, just, are you, Chris? It just didn't make business sense to uh -huh. buy more. And um, this gives us, it, it is a complement to our reduced, um, our lighting, mm -hmm. to our energy efficiency of the entire building. We have a solar thermal um, that gives us 95% of our hot water. So we kind of did a variety of things so we don't have to depend on, you know, just electricity or the natural gas or it's, it's a nice, diverse approach. Well, we wanted our audience to have the chance to see the construction of the wind turbine. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it took a lot longer than this film you're going to see. This is a time-lapse version that's been provided to us by Alborisi. And we'll have the chance to see that now. And as they begin to look at the time-lapse, the actual construction process for putting up the wind turbine was about how long? Well, the... Let me Go ask, back. is this, well, is this the um, wind, the blade replacement that we gave yeah. Yes, the blade replacement, okay. yes, it is. We, um, two blades had broken and we ha actually had to take them down um, and we bought three new ones and uh -huh. this is in June. The actual construction, I wasn't here during that time. You all can, I don't know how long the concrete was poured well, and the... Probably the concrete pad that it sets on took the longest time. Right. The actual erection of the turbine was very speedy. Uh, and we fabricated that extension arm in the center of the post that it sits on. So all together, probably it was a month in the making. But most of that is underground, and you'd never see it now because it's part of that concrete pad. Uh -huh. The concrete pad is actually so extensive that if you would have just laid it on top of the ground, it would have held the turbine up oh. just because of the weight and mass of the concrete. But, of course, it's down below ground now, and the turbine sits on it. But with those uh, added uh, features, it makes up 20% uh, uh, of our power that we generate on site. So it's part of the plan that we are trying to reduce our dependence on all the community systems. Just like with the water retention, it saves anyone from having to deal with the water runoff in the uh, water systems of the community. And so uh, with, with also the reduction of water that we need mm -hmm. for the prairie, it really helps control the resources that we're dependent on. And if you think, well, it's not so much that one company does it. No, but if every company did it, 
it would make a tremendous uh, increase in what we do for the environment. You'd have to build less facilities for the community, which would be less costly for all the taxpayers, and it would just reduce all of the demands we put on municipal systems. Speaking of cost, we've had some questions come in about the return of cost for the construction of the building. Yes. Let's talk as an example of utility costs. Yes. Um, talk about the distinction between what it was like in the old building and what it's like here. Sure. When we moved over here, it was about the same population of people. We tracked what the utility costs were and we saved that first year moving here about $78,000. But recall that the old building was about 80,000 square feet. Uh -huh. This was 110,000 square feet. So we actually reduced our uh, uh, metering and the cost of utilities while we increased the size of the building by 40, 50 percent. Wow, that's pretty impressive. That's exceptionally impressive. And, and, and obviously, Krista, you and Grant work with Vertigy, the, the green building arm here. Do, are you guys finding that there's additional, because we had a bunch of questions about this, are more, are more and more people interested? Um, do you sense, uh, is it easy to get people to think green? Um, how's that working now in terms of actually people rethinking the way they want to construct stuff? We find uh, more and more people all the time. Uh, there's more incentives for people to do it other than just the rising cost of gas and electric. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of municipalities are encouraging people to do this with incentives and uh, we all know the economy is a little down now. Construction market has suffered a little bit because of that. It seems like everyone that's building a building now are tending to want to build a green building. Mm -hmm. They see all the benefits of that and it's I think sometimes easier for them to get funding for their buildings. So there's a lot of reasons people are more and more figuring out as uh, people are graduating out of school getting Young folks are coming into the market. That's really how they all think, more so than us mm -hmm. older guys. You know, and so it's just unacceptable for them to work in a building that's not like this. So we're seeing that trend push the market, I think, as well. I also, I, I, I think he was referring to John as one of those older guys. Well, we'll talk about that as a, as a Christy, what do you want to Well, add? I was just going to say that it really allows us to rethink what we need. Um, green building, I equate with smart building. Do you really need fancy countertops or would your money be best spent on an efficient system that materials, you'll buy um, stone once, um, but your mechanical equipment pays off time and time and again. And we have owners that are looking at that like a healthcare facility and you run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they said, you know, we're going to spend um, our money on a very efficient system and it'll pay off. So we have that that's really changed a lot of um, owners and developers thinking. And I think it's a good reset that's happened. Well, it's amazing what you've done here. It's probably important for us to talk a little bit about Leeds itself, mm -hmm. because obviously you guys are a Leeds platinum building. Um, in case our audience doesn't know, what does LEED stand for and how do you determine platinum status versus gold or silver and that kind of thing? Um, when, I don't even know, like well, 10 I, years ago, uh -huh. I was just going to start. It's a rating system mm -hmm. from the U.S. Green Building Council. And um, people got together and said, what can we put together that um, keeps everybody on the design team for looking towards the same ultimate goal of energy efficiency, smart material um, use and um, operations on the, um, the end. And that's what lead stands, uh, leadership in energy and environmental design. Um, and you get, you get points based, John, on how you do certain things, right? Like the fact that you're using, you reuse materials here gets you points. The fact that you've got like the wind turbine gets you points, that kind of thing. Sure, energy use, water efficiency, air quality inside, the quality of the uh, surroundings for the employees, all of these are rated with certain points attached. And when we did this building, we were the first ones to reach 60 points on the lead scale. Now that is just changing, I think this year or next they are changing to a 110 point system. But in general, we were the first ones to break 60 points and uh, uh, we were very proud of that. As I said before, this was our first green project, and no one really told us that we couldn't do that on our <laughs> first project. But uh, we had very creative people uh, that worked together, and it's amazing how it really brought the team together. We had workmen on the site who were really engaged in their ideas about how 
we could make this more efficient, how we could create a distribution system for the electric and the communications, and how that would be easily maintained over time. You see, a lot of times in construction, and I think we're guilty of this, or at least we were before this project, of just bringing people in for what their hands could build, not really considering what their minds could add to the project, and certainly not considering their heart and how they would dedicate it to a project which was unusual, mm -hmm. something that was different, something that they could make an imprint on. And if you know construction people, we love to leave a monument behind of what we've done. And for the people who worked on this project, they brought not only their hands and their skills, they brought their minds and their thinking and their hearts about how they felt about the project, which made it a much more engaging project for all of those employees that worked on the project. Well, John, thanks so much for letting us have a chance to go through the finished product because yeah. it's just been phenomenal. Uh, we're standing right here at the interior exterior meeting point, so to speak. This morning we had a chance to really talk about the external part of the building, its side orientation, the wind turbine, the use of the prairie restoration. This morning, this afternoon, I should say, in our one o'clock program, we'll spend a lot more time inside and you'll learn about the ventilation system, you'll learn about lighting, we'll talk more about the materials they used inside the building as well to create that environment that really makes it a good place for everybody to work. John, Grant, Christy, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Thanks to all of you, as always, for being part of HEC TV Live. We'll see you at 1 o'clock for Building Green Inside. Look forward to seeing you then. Bye, everybody.